Great. So that was an awesome first chapter in our journey. Uh, I, again, thank you to all the speakers for um, just the crazy things that you've talked about and have been, I've been thinking about and I'm excited to talk about more today. But uh, before we uh, get there, we're still learning. So now we're going to shift away from looking um, just a little bit, uh, I'm looking at bacteria in their ability to produce materials, and now actually looking at bacteria as uh, displays and as input devices. And so this is really important, especially for wearable biotech, because bacteria, because they're living, care and are already monitoring and already have these built-in sensors for a lot of the things that we care about and that our body is monitoring. And so we have these sensors, we have ways to make them display, and so what can this reveal about our body, our state, our life. And so we're going to have another three really inspiring speakers. We'll start with Katia Vega, who's from UV, UC Davis, doing some really cool work in tattoos, or, uh, that sense monitor. We're then going to go to Xin Yu Lu, who's from MIT, uh, bioengineering or mechanical engineering. And she's doing work involved with uh, wearable, living, uh, or sorry, living hydrogels um, in uh, flexible displays. And then finally, we're going to talk with Peter Wen, who is working with uh, textiles uh, that can tell us about what we've been exposed to and lab coats that can let us know when things go wrong. So, all right, um, Katya. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Katia Vega. I'm an assistant professor from the Department of Design at UC Davis. And uh, I will go back to this image that Patty was uh, showing to us at the very beginning. Uh, I guess that most of uh, us that uh, learn about wearables maybe saw this image before from uh, 1993. And I always thought that it was amazing to think about to be in that time with these people around campus with all these electronics or computers and sensing everything and having all this information from their body or the environment. And I wanted to also show you this image uh, almost 20 years after that. Um, uh, I was a postdoc here at MIT Media Lab a Joe Paradiso's group, and you can see over here, maybe you recognize some of them, like Cindy, Xing, Arteng, Nang, Gershon, and there are other ones that were not pictured. Uh, we were uh, the textile group, and we were dis a discussion group that we were talking about uh, what will be the wearables now. And if you see, comparing with the previous picture, uh, <laughs> it looks more like we are. Uh, technology could become invisible and we could be what we wanted to express and how we wanted to be shown. So I want also to show you a little bit of what it means for me to have technology invisible. And I started this journey in 2012 when I created this concept called beauty technology that is a, was a way of <laughs> embed electronics into cosmetics. So you could imagine uh, maybe some conductive makeup that you blink and you turn on the lights, or some fingernails with chips, these RFIDs that you could pay the metro with your RFID chip on your fingernail, or hair extensions that just by touching your hair, you could send your location to the police uh, without being in danger. Uh, so it was a way to embed electronics into our body and become these two meters of skin that we have into an interactive platform. Uh, but after that, and after being part uh, here of the Media Lab, uh, we start with, actually, with uh, Nick Barry, uh, thinking about what if we go deeper into the skin? And what will happen if we could embed uh, technology inside of the skin? And we joined many researchers, actually, since people here from the Media Lab, like Xing, Liu, Birch Kang, Ning Berry, 
Uh, we were from uh, Patty's and Joe Paradiso's group. And we also uh, joined uh, with Harvard Medical School. And we were creating this project called the Dermal Abyss. And it was these tattoos, but instead, instead of using traditional inks, we were using biosensors. And these biosensors that we could inject inside of the skin, and they could react and change its color, revealing information that we could usually don't have access to. Because, for example, if you wanted to have access to your cholesterol levels or your glucose, you have to make some blood tests. Uh, but what will happen if your tattoo is changing color and will give you that information? Um, we were doing some experiments, and we were even using a tattoo gun and injecting this ink uh, in big skin and trying to make it to change its color. And we were doing that because inside of the skin, uh, we have this liquid, this interstitial fluid. And if the ink that is in the dermis that is in direct contact with these fluids, we could detect different information that is inside of our body. So for that, we were starting doing uh, several tests with some fluorescent biosensors and some other chromatic biosensors. Uh, the fluorescence we were using sodium and pH, uh, so the intensity of the fluorescence was giving us some information of lower or higher pH, for example. And the chromatic uh, biosensors like glucose or pH2 were also giving us different colors uh, that could also could be reflected into a tattoo. Uh, after that, we were also creating now with uh, Ali Jettison from Imperial College of London and other colleagues. We were extending this research, adding new biosensors too, but also what will happen in the same tattoo, we will have like different colors of tattoos and we could read that through another software we develop with a camera, with your cell phone, so you could read that information and detect different information since the same tattoo. Uh, and uh, of course, this is a project still in development. I cannot make a tattoo to you right now. Uh, but uh, because there are still many tests that we have to do. Uh, Cytologically, uh, we could think about permeability, re uh, reversibility. Uh, uh, we did that in an ex vivo model. We have to move in uh, in vivo uh, clinical trials. You must think about how usually drugs takes a long time to develop. But today I wanted to share to you uh, what were some lessons learned of creating these kind of projects. Uh, first I was, uh, I was imagining what it means to have the skin as a display. How we have like these cells tissues that could maybe convert into information that could reveal and have like, access to these kind of like a portal to our inner self. Uh, also thinking about technology that could be indistinguishable from the human body by using tattoos and technology that could be actually looking as part of your body by using tattoos. Uh, we are used to have in interfaces some buttons or some screens that you touch to having some kind of interactions. What will happen if our metabolism is the input for the interface? In this way, like you could think about what you eat or what's happening inside of your body could be revealed. And also, uh, in my experience, uh, since the beauty technology project, but also the tattoo projects, I was working with different artists. Different artists like I think a saloon, a saloon uh, when I was doing my fingernails, and tattoo artists in the tattoo studios that they were also be, they were very inspiring for me because they were creating their own designs and their own art and combining that with the sensors that we were implanted to them. So I think that if you think about wearables today, we have these 
big uh, technology industries that have a combination with a uh, fashion industry. So I envision in the future this other kind of combination between technology industry, but also beauty salons or tattoo studios or all these different body modification te technologies that could also embed these technologies that we are creating today. And as we are also talking about global in interfaces, I want to share also another project from my student, uh, L.D. Lazaro, that we are also thinking about how to create sustainable prototyping. And for that, if we think about us as designers and creators of technology, we have a waste problem. We are generating different ways since like the different iterations that we create for having one prototype or the different leftovers for creating our designs. And even like after that, we have unused prototypes that are in our shelves. And this is how my lab actually looks like. <laughs> And if you think about the degradation time of materials, it makes, I want you maybe to reflect about our practice as prototypers or designers or creators of technology, of what it means to have all these ways that we are generating in our community. Uh, so this project uh, was embedded different ways to use Biodegradable materials, in this case mycelium, because you could create different shapes, is water resistant, is heat resistant, and we were embedded that, and that's why we were using electronics to create these kind of ways to prepare and enhance uh, different tangibles, interfaces on our body, but also different objects. We're creating also different workshops and also creating different objects that showcase these ideas of having also biodegradable materials. And for that, I will just leave you with this cycle that shows how could be a sustainable prototyping life cycle. And this, bio, like this uh, project right now, I was showing you mainly in what it means to use and then end of life of the materials. But we have to think about ahead or before that, what it means to, for having that material that you are using for digital fabrication, you have to have, like, create the raw material, having distribution, doing the manufacturing, and sending that for you to use and create your prototypes. So I want to just leave you with that to having you as a reflection of your practice, and then maybe in the workshop we could also talk about what it means and some recommendations for improving our, our prototypes and the way that we create in, in a more sustainable way. So thank you very much. Thank you.